Hello everyone and welcome to Nature Life Online. I'm Christina Torrent and I'm going to be your host today. Uh, first of all, just saying really sorry to start in a few minutes late. We've been having some uh, technical difficulties behind the scenes, but we're here now and I'm really, really looking forward to start talking uh, about snails with you. But before we start cracking on, uh, just to thank you if you've been watching and just to let you know, for those of you who haven't and are new to Nature Life, what Nature Life is. now. Nature Life is an opportunity for the Natural History Museum in London to bring its collections, its stories, its science to you, to your homes. And we invite scientists from the museum to talk about that. I've got loads of questions for our guests today, but you can also send your own questions because we're streaming live. Put them on the chats um, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Also, uh, we are a charity, so if you're able to donate, any donation is always great for us and we really, really appreciate it. But uh, without any further ado, uh, let me introduce you to the topic that we're going to talk today. In case you haven't noticed, we're going to be talking about snails. Now, these animals tend to be overlooked sometimes, but they're actually incredible. We are going to look at some of the thousands of species that are around the world and the amazing diversity that they um, present. And who better than our curator, John Ablett, to talk about these amazing creatures. Hello, John. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Christina, how are you doing? Yeah, not bad. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. Now, John, uh, your title at the museum is Senior Curator in Charge of Mollusk. Now, that's a long title, but what it means is that you look after uh, the group of animals called the mollusks. We can see a, a picture of some of them there. This is a very varied group. It's huge, had loads of species on them. We can see different, very, very different animals that are part of this group. We're going to talk about one particular group, the snails. Um, but before we talk about them, can you tell us a little bit more about this group that you look after uh, at the museum? Yes, yeah, so mollusks are a really diverse group of animals, probably the most diverse in body plan for any of the phyla that, uh, that make up the, the animals. Uh, they include things like bivalves, clams, mussels, oysters that have two valves. They include things like cephalopods, squid, mussels, uh, no, they don't, squid, octopus, and this is a lovely paper argonaut shell. Uh, and the group we're talking about is the gastropods. Uh, and that's the group that includes snails. And the gastropods generally, there's always exceptions to the rule, uh, have a coiled shell, or throughout their history, they had a coiled shell. Uh, and everyone knows what a snail looks like, that lovely coiled snail. And you can see that, that same shell shape at the, the bottom of the ocean in marine snails, but the group we're going to be talking about live on land. And there's two kind of subgroups that live on land. There's the group, the terrestrial, pul the pulmonates, as they were formerly called, uh, which kind of have a, a, a evolved a kind of lung-like feature. Uh, and some of them still have gills, but are able to survive out of water as well. So there's two groups, um, but yeah, this is generally what they look like. That's amazing. Um, and John, in case people were wondering, we're looking at snails. What about slugs? Are slugs snails as well? They don't have that shell that we were talking about. No, but they do have the evolutionary history of a shell and they, kind of, they do have a shell of sorts. It's an internal shell. So if you look behind the antenna, you can see that sort of slightly textured uh, skin on the, the back of the slug. And underneath that is a slug plate. And here's one I prepared earlier. Did I prepare earlier? I did, I did, I did. So these are some <laughs> shell plates uh, from the leopard slug, which is a species, a big species of slug that you get Limax maximus uh, in the UK and across Europe. And this is the little shell plate that exists under the skin. So you can see that they still have a shell, but it's not on the outside. I guess a bit like squid and octopus having a shell on the inside too. That's amazing. And uh, isn't that a little bit disadvantage for the disadvantage for the um, slugs, John? Because you would think, well, a, snail, uh, a shell is quite handy. You can retreat into it. It protects you. We'll see more about those shells later on. So what about the slugs? Are they completely unprotected then? No, they're not. And, and we think that kind of sluggishness, shelllessness has evolved sort of five, six, seven times uh, throughout the terrestrial uh, land snails. Uh, and the reason is because if you don't have a shell, there are certain things you can do better. So one thing is to build a shell, you need to be able to take the uh, the energy, well, you need energy to do it. It's biologically expensive to, to build this structure. You need to live in an area where you have the, the raw ingredients, the calcium from the shell or from, from the soil or from the water or from rocks in order to have the raw materials to build the shell. A shell might make you heavier. It might make it harder for the, the snail to climb, uh, harder to dig, harder to, to hide away in cracks and crevices. 
And if you think about it the opposite around, a slug that has a reduced or, or no external shell uh, may find it much easier to climb, to dig, to, to tunnel, to, to, to bury itself between cracks. And although you're right, it, it might be a little bit more like to dry out and it's, it's a little bit more, um, uh, it doesn't have anything to hide from predators, but there is definitely some biological advantages. Absolutely, a bit of a balance. The shell gives you some things, the shells also take you some other things, so it's, it's, it's good to find them there. Um, now, uh, what I want to say to our audience is, that, as you can see, I've got loads of questions for John, but if you have your own ones, put them on the chat, um, either if you're watching from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and we'll try to ask those questions to John as well. Don't be shy. But John, in the meantime, can you tell us a little bit about where we can find snails? Definitely in the UK, we've seen them uh, probably across Europe, but are where and what other places are they are they around in in the world so you get you get snails everywhere except antarctica and in fact you do occasionally get snails in antarctica when they're brought on by the actions of humans things like the scientific bases are down there so snails have been recorded there but apart from that you get snails everywhere you get them uh, on the shoreline uh, where the sea meets the water you get them at the top of mountains uh, the top of the tallest mountains you get them in desert regions you get them in swamps up trees under bark everywhere there's pretty much nowhere that you know there's no flying snails being discovered yet but you know you never know that's amazing uh now john we had a first question coming in um and it's actually quite interesting uh dylan is asking are snails born with the shells so they are yes um they have a, a very small shell uh which you can still see uh when the adults so if you look at the very few the beginning starts of the world under a microscope there's a small section called the protocon, which are the embryonic worlds, which are the shells that are formed within uh, the eggshell, because uh, snails are hatched from a shell. Uh, so yes, they have a little shell, and then they take uh, uh, calcium from the environment, and they build up their shell gradually. So I guess a little bit like tree lines, you know, you can sort of count the shell size uh, to a certain degree to, to kind of get an estimation of age. But yeah, and then they keep adding material to the shell to grow bigger and bigger. That was a great question. So thank you so much, Dylan. Uh, so keep sending uh, questions because we, we love getting them from you as well. Um, and remember, if you're enjoying the show and if you can make a donation, uh, just make a donation on YouTube. You can do it by the chat or you can go directly to our website. We'll put a link as well there. We have another question from uh, Nazim. This is coming from Facebook and they're asking, are slugs stronger than snails? Maybe that has to do something with the uh, shell Ooh. talk. Um, I mean, you get some very, very big slugs and some very, very big snails. The strongest slug, do you know, I don't know if that's ever been investigated. There's a call for global scientists, what is the strongest slug or snails? Um, <laughs> it depends on the size. So uh, the largest snail is the giant African land snail. Looks like a china No, no, this is not quite the largest as they get. They get up to about 20 centimetres in shell height, or about 15. Uh, the whole body extended nearly up to 30 centimetres. So that's a pretty big shell. And they have to resist, you know, predation by animals. So they're pretty strong. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, the snails are bigger than the slugs. So I, I'm going to vote for snails are stronger. <laughs> That's brilliant, John. Um, now, in fact, uh, I'm glad that you brought the giant snail up because uh, Noah, who tends to watch the shows a lot, he's, uh, they're only seven. They're asking, what is the biggest species of snails? So is it the giant African snail, um, the biggest one that we can find? Yep, and the smallest, I've just forgotten the name. Um, it, it lives in caves uh, and cliff faces in China, and it's about 0 0.8 millimeters in height. Um, it was discovered by uh, Barnabal Gurgley a few years ago. Uh, and yeah, that is currently, although every few years someone finds a smaller one, so the race is on. Get lucky. There you go. We, we popped a photo over there there for the smallest snail. You can see it in a, in a needle um, compared to a needle there. So that's incredible. So like very, they can go to very, very big and very, very small. So I think we've already started about the variety um, of, of the snails that are out there. Um, and I imagine also living in so many places around the world, they have amazing adaptations. So we're getting loads of questions and don't worry, we'll get through as many as possible. Uh, but uh, John, let's first talk about um, a very, very cool story from a particular snail adapted to live in really um, dry areas, Eremina desertorum. Can you tell us about the museum story of that, uh, yes. of that, of that snail, John? Yeah, this is a really cool story. So um, lots of snails uh, just go into what we call a state of estivation when it's too hot. And you see this in snails in this country. If you ever found a snail, it, has, it looks almost like a piece of tissue paper, a gummy piece of tissue paper over the aperture, the opening of the shell. Uh, that's it. Uh, it's called an epiphram. And that's the plug that a snail makes to stop it from drying out. It basically seals itself up 
and it stops water escaping, so it can kind of ride out the dry periods. And this happens in snails in very, very warm countries, as well as the more moderate temperatures like in the UK. And Eremina desertorum is a species that lives in Egypt. And in 1846, uh, when we were still part of the British Museum, uh, a, an explorer brought back a, a few examples of this, this species from Egypt to put on display in the museum. And at that time, pretty much everything that was in the collection was, was stuck to the wall, and it was stuck to a board like this, in fact, this is the insane board, uh, on the wall, so that everyone could see the great diversity of life. Uh, and after being in the museum for about a couple of years, uh, four years, uh, it was noticed, one of the curators, someone that was doing my job, noticed that this epigram, this plug, was over one of the apertures of the shell. So he took it off display and he popped it into a glass of water uh, and the snail kind of uh, came out of its shell, literally. Uh, it uh, was refreshed, it had access to water uh, and it lived for two years on the curator's desk, which is a lovely idea. And then when it when it died, it went back into the collections where it is today. <laughs> and we can see the picture of that specimen there and the, the little label when it was stuck as well is, is such an amazing story. So, uh, John, you mentioned estivation. Um, that's something similar to hibernation. So estivation for heat, hibernation for cold. Do a snails then hibernate and estivate? Yes, they do. So you might not, not notice that many snails around in wintertime. And that's because lots of, well, some of them die off, but of course, Lots of them do try and hide out to keep a little bit warmer to lower their life system so they can survive. Uh, so you, you might find them buried in the soil or, or hidden away in plants or under rocks. Uh, you can see, uh, actually the one on the left is a freshwater snail. That's not quite the, um, I think that's a terrestrial fulminate, mm -hmm. but it's very similar. Uh, but on the right hand side, you can see this is Faber Fasana, I think. Uh, and especially in very hot countries in the Mediterranean, you find uh, the snails will aggregate up something like uh, a plant stalk to get off the ground, to get off the very hottest part uh, of the of the earth in order to reduce their, their uh, heat. And sometimes they even swap places to take it in turns to make sure that uh, they all get the cool spot. So different methods of uh, trying to keep cool uh, uh, in very, very hot and also when it's very cold as well. That's amazing. And that leads quite nicely. You mentioned them um, burying themselves on the ground with a question that came from uh, Victoria, who's watching on YouTube. They, they were asking, are there snails that live un, um, deep underground, like in caves or in mines? Or is it, do they only uh, bury themselves when they have to hibernate? Do we know that? Um, they don't tend to be very deep underground, but you often get them in the top few centimetres of the soil. Uh, it's sometimes when you're looking for specific species, when you're on field work, you know you've got to to dig, there are some, uh, the, the, the grave digger's snail, uh, got the Latin name at the moment, uh, but you often find those in, in burial sites because of the amount of fresh earth that comes up from deeper down. Uh, and yeah, there's definitely certain species that like to feed on things like earthworms. Uh, there's the ghost slug, which you find in whales, which slurps up uh, worms like spaghetti. So yeah, different snails live in different habitats and some of them live not really deep down, but yeah, in the top, you know, a couple of tens of centimeters of soil. And then you get them up trees as well. So. <laughs> now, uh, John, let's move to um, and the amazing diversity of a group that you, you've admitted that you love is your favourite snail. Um, and also when we, are we were chatting, you call it um, them the Darwin finches, but in the snails. Uh, so let's have a look at them. They have a very uh, convolvulated, decorated um, shells. Um, and they're tiny, aren't they? Can you tell us a little bit more about these guys? Yeah, these are really cool. These, these are definitely my favourite. These are a group of snails uh, called Plectostoma. Uh, it's a genus of snails, a group of snails that live in Borneo. And they live at the top of the limestone mountains they have there. And these limestone mountains act like, like islands. So just in Darwin's finches, you had literal islands surrounded by water. These, are, these mountains are islands, and surrounding these islands is the forest. There is water. There are barriers that these snails, because they're very, very tiny, they're about the size of a letter A in a newspaper. So, you know, we're talking like a mil, two mil by two mil, very, very small. But you can see that because these areas are separated and there's no real way of traveling from one mountain top to the other mountain top, these groups have, have evolved in isolation and they've evolved specific defenses in order to the specific predators that exist on each of these locations. So you can see some of them have spines on them uh, uh, projecting from the shell. And it's thought that these help stop predatory slugs. Lots of slugs like feeding on smaller snail species in order to get some of the, the meat and also the calcium from the shell. Uh, so these spines we think help stop animals from latching on. Uh, you can see the very kind of twisted aperture, this kind of uh, trumpet-like snail shell. And that's thought to stop things like beetles and ants getting in and kind of attacking them that way. 
So the different methods of defense rather than food in the example of Darwin's finches, it, it, we think it's predation pressure that has caused the change in the very change in these kind of shell shapes. And absolutely stunning. Like I said, very, very small. Uh, I've got a little box of them. I don't know how many hundred or thousand there are in there. You probably can't see. Very, very small. Uh, <laughs> and I, I often think this is why, you know, snails are overlooked. Because some of them are very, very small. When you collect something like this, you're using a pinhead to flip them off the rock into a little container. Uh, you know, quite, they're not the kind of thing you're going to trip over while you're walking through, uh, but absolutely stunning and a great example of, of adaptation to the environment. I suppose we used to seeing the snails are about, you know, the, the normal snail size and we forget that there must be loads of them that, that might be uh, smaller. Now, John, another great question from um, our viewers. Um, some people were asking, uh, they were asking, how long do snails live? So do we know how long, does it depend on the species or, or we just don't know? It does depend on the, on, the, on the species and most snails don't live very long, a couple of years, um, one or two, uh, averagely. But of course, when you keep snails in captivity, they can last much longer because you're taking lots of the pressures away from the environment. But lots of these animals, because they're so small, you just don't study them uh, in the wild. You know, they're, they're, it's not like a, a larger animal that you can, you can, you can monitor. But, but most of all, we don't think they're particularly long-lived animals, although there are cases of, of giant African land snails living 10 plus years in captivity. Wow, that's quite a long time as well. Uh, really question over there. Um, now, John, you were talking a little bit about the adaptation of the shells um, and, and and how they, they use this adaptation to, to fight the predators to survive the, the predation of some animals. Um, but there's some other um, snails that have other very cool adaptations as well. It's not just the hardness of the shell. Tell us a little bit about um, the garlic snail. I think that defense has something to do with this name, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so this is the garlic snail, Oxychylus aliaris, aliaris being Latin for garlic. And they uh, they found in the UK and they're a member of the glass snail family. And they're actually quite hard to differentiate. There's about 10 or so species, all look very similar. Any slight differences, you have to get your microscope or your hand lens out, looking at the fine structure of the, snail, the shell. But one of the things is when you find one of these types of snail, the first thing I do to try and identify it is give it a little prod, a gentle prod. Uh, and sometimes it'll emit a smell that smells very strongly and distinctly of garlic. In that case, you can identify it straight away as this particular species. And it's because uh, this, this releases this chemical deterrent to stop things like birds uh, from eating it or small mammals that might be put off by the taste of garlic. Uh, you know, that's possibly one of the reasons garlic smells so strongly is to put off animals from eating the plant. Uh, and, the, and the snail is utilizing it uh, in order to act as a chemical defense. And that's really important um, because lots of animals don't use, you know, sight uh, in order to attack predators and, and snails and in fact themselves, they don't use uh, sight very much. They have very poor vision generally and chemical senses are often much more important in the animal kingdom. There you go. So we had Dylan actually ask us, how do they avoid being eaten by different animals? So there's one question here, but there's another way. And I really love this example of how they use being left-handed or right-handed, I'm quoting that, uh, to stop being eaten. Tell us about the satsuma snails and what does left-handed and right-handed means? Okay, so most snails are right-handed. So they are what we call dextral, and so we're going to find one. Uh, so here it is. So this is a right-handed snail. So if you see the aperture is on this side and they coil in this direction. And occasionally uh, you get a left-handed variation. So you can see it's exactly the same, but the mirror image. And it's a very common uh, mutation. It, it's just one gene change and you get a left-handed individual. And this is actually quite interesting to other scientists uh, because it helps to understand chirality and changing in things like humans. So humans can be born you know, the way around, a little side note. Um, and normally you get this as a random mutation in, in populations. It doesn't last very long because of the way that snails mate. Because they have this torsion in the shell, uh, if, you, if you curl the other way, your uh, genitals are on the wrong side of your head for when you're mating. So you're unlikely to pass your genetic material onto the next generation. You're unlikely to have left-handed babies. So they just don't generally exist in a population. In some groups, however, by changing the way they mate, uh, you actually do get left-handed uh, variants of the shell. And in some cases, this provides uh, uh, an actual benefit. So in the Japanese island of Satsuma, there is a snake that feeds upon the right-handed snail. And it has one long tooth that especially evolves a kind of toothpick in order to slide into the shell and remove the meat. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't quite go into the left-handed way. It's just 
at the wrong angle. And so you get a much more higher population of the left-handed ones in this region because it, it has much less chance of being predated upon by the snake. It just can't get a grip of it. That's amazing. It's incredible. Poor snake as well. Um, and that actually links a little bit with um, a question that uh, Noah was asking as well. Do bats eat snails, John? Or is it only snakes that eat them? And maybe sometimes humans. <laughs> <laughs> so lots and lots of animals. Do you know what? I don't know if I know of a case where um, bats eat snails. I'm sure they probably do, uh, especially cave snails. Uh, I would be very surprised if they don't, because pretty much everything eats snails. Birds, small mammals, other snails, insects. There's a whole group of, of uh, snails that evolved to become snail eating. The Streptax is a great example. Um, yeah, pretty much anything will, will try and have a go at a snail. So, yeah, everyone loves eating snails. All things. Uh, now, we've had a look at some examples of the amazing variety um, and diversity of the snails there. But, John, you don't have to go that far to find this amazing diversity. You can find it as well in, in the UK, right? Can you tell us a little bit about the snails in the UK um, when, whenever you can? Yeah, so um, there's a huge variety of snails. I don't think people quite realise just how many. There's 100 species of snail in the UK. There's about 40 species of slug and there's about 50 species of freshwater snail. So it's nearly 200. And you know, people think of it and they think of probably the garden snail, maybe a banded snail, maybe a scargo, the Roman snail. Uh, but they just don't often understand. And, and I think if people go out and have a little look, uh, you might find door snails, tall slender door snails uh, on, the, on the trunks of trees, have a, a root around in the moss. Uh, and the variety within a species can be enormous. Uh, this is a group called Sapia nemoralis, the band, one of the banded snail species. And this is just one draw. We have thousands of these in the collection. Um, people often ask, why do you have so many things? And so we compare variation uh, across time and space. And I think you've got a lovely picture to demonstrate the diversity of these. You get some that are pure yellow, you get some that are rosy, you get some that are three bands, five bands, unbanded. Just absolutely beautiful snails. Uh, here's a lovely example of some of the banded varieties. Uh, you've got some plain yellow ones, uh, some red ones. Uh, and the wonderful thing is no one really knows why. Oh, yeah, perfect example. No one really knows why you get this variety. Lots of people have, have thought of theories, but none of them quite ring true when we, we look at the evidence. So um, possibly breaking up the outline of the shell or, or uh, hiding from predators, you know, what camouflage is best in different environments? Do you get more yellow ones in areas where there's more yellow in the background and things like that? But it doesn't seem to quite work. People have looked at solar radiation. So do you get different colors that might reflect more heat where it's hotter, where there's more open habitats? And that doesn't seem to work. And there's lots of research going on, especially the University of Nottingham have a big group looking at this banding and then possibly why it could be occurring. So still so many questions to ask in the world. They're amazing. We're going to pay more attention when I when I see these guys around. Um, John, that actually links really nicely with um, a question that um, Barbara was asking uh, in the chat. Uh, they were asking, what are the determinants to the colour of the shell of the snails? Um, and can the colour of, of, of snails change when they grow, depending on what they eat? So, oh, do you know, what? I'm not very good on the colour. Uh, it's a whole different discipline. Uh, and uh, one of our research here, Suzanne Williams, uh, looks at that in marine snails. Um, but there's certainly a pattern that is laid down. It's a genetically applied pattern, and it doesn't change over time. It can fade slightly. Uh, you get these beautiful things. This ligula snail, which has one coil that runs all the way down. It changes colour as it goes down through blues, reds, greens, brown. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Um, so I don't believe the diet changes it, um, but it's about the pigments that are laid down as the shell is laid down. That's amazing. Um, now, John, we've had a, a look at the amazing uh, variety. There's loads of snails um, around the world. We've seen how many there are in the UK as well. Um, but I think even with, with this question, there's still, there's obvious, there's still a lot to discover and a lot to research on them as well, um, on them. And um, there are also even new species that we've never found, even new species that we haven't found and that might be going extinct already, right? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the wonderful things about working on invertebrates, everyone should work on invertebrates, not birds, uh, is just the amount of diversity that yet to be discovered. You know, it's not rare to find new species and we have type collections in the museum. These are the vouchers for new species uh, and they are being sent in every other week. You know, we get them sent to the museum for depositing for other scientists to look at. Um, so it's not rare to find a new species of mollusk. And of course, we have to try and uh, describe the natural world uh, in, uh, with our understanding that there are huge extinction events. In fact, there are more land snails 
uh, become extinct in the last few hundred years due to man-made changes than any other group of animals uh, known. And, and over 70% of these are in island habitats, which are often more uh, uh, delicately balanced in terms of uh, the, the ecosystems in general. Uh, and there's huge pressures, things like habitat destruction. For example, I've worked quite a lot in Southeast Asia, and you get huge snail diversity around these limestone mountains, a bit like we were saying with the plectostoma that live uh, in there. And, you know, you, they, they, they set up uh, huge cement factories literally outside a mountain and they'll demolish the mountain often um, without being surveyed first. And who knows what kind of uh, species uh, are lost before they're even recorded. Um, some may be in old museum collections that haven't yet been described, but I'm sure many are lost uh, to science and we'll never know about them. Uh, land use change, drainage, um, climate change, all these things are going to impact and especially because snails don't tend to live over a wide area, you know, they often have very uh, niche ecological um, requirements, which means that they, they don't spread out that far. Um, so, yeah, they are a huge concern. Um, and But, uh, you know, people are doing things about it. Some endangered species like uh, the Akitanella in Hawaii, there are breeding programs and, and releasing programs to try and stop them from becoming extinct. So there's a little bit of hope. That was my next question. Are there any efforts? We've seen big conservation efforts for big animals normally, big vertebrates, big mammals, but do snails um, get a, a little bit of, of effort put into look at, looking after them and protecting them as well? They do. I mean, they don't quite have the, the kind of, look, you know, the polar bear, panda-esque kind of uh, efforts yet, but maybe one day. Uh, I mean, there's really terrible stories. Things like uh, the, the giant African land snail, which we talked about, which released uh, in Hawaii, in the 1950s and then uh, in order to try and remove them they, they introduced the predatory rosy wolf snail which is a predatory snail uh, from the southern US and they released it into Hawaii hoping that it would eat all the giant African land snails uh, but it didn't it ate a, a huge amount of the native fauna uh, snails these, these Akatanella snails are very beautiful snails very culturally important very ecologically important snails from Hawaii uh, and uh, many species have gone extinct already but again Breeding programs have been set up in the island, in other institutions around the world, and, and these are released. They release them in these little, very cute kind of um, uh, areas with the little electric fences to try and stop the predatory snails from, from getting in. Uh, and you know, in some cases, this is helping to stop them going extinct. And in fact, when I was doing some field work in Vietnam, uh, we found a species uh, called Bertia cambendi bodiensis. Is one it's actually a left-handed one, uh, and this was actually recorded as extinct. Uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, but we found it alive uh, in, uh, in a, well, a secretive area. We're not going to say where it is because it's actually collected for its beautiful shell. Uh, and we've set up breeding programs with uh, ZSL in London and also in Vietnam itself uh, and being reintroduced into the wild. So, yeah, there are some lovely efforts going on. That's amazing. That's a really positive story as well with John. And what a discovery as well. It must have been amazing to find something that it was supposed to be extinct. That's brilliant. Yeah. And John, also another uh, good news there. Um, Dylan made a donation as well to the museum. So thank you so much, Dylan. If you're enjoying the the show, we're really close to the end. But if you have been joining it, please consider making a donation. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. We always appreciate it. So yeah, thank you so much, Dylan. Um, but John, with this a few minutes that we have uh, left, we talk about big um, efforts of conservation of the snails and protecting them as well. Um, but is there anything that we can do in our homes? Anyone that is watching, is there any way that we can protect slugs and um, sorry snails and slugs as well? As we said, they're also part of this group. I, I mean, one thing you can do is to try and uh, maybe try and appreciate the diversity of these things in your garden. Go out and have a little look, root around in your garden or a local park area, local woodland, if you can get to one, looking at compost heap under stones. Because I sometimes think if you go and make the effort to look at things, you kind of have a more of an idea of the importance. Uh, but by, you know, think of all the small animals and birds that use them as food. Um, if you're a gardener, uh, maybe uh, think about some of the uh, molluscicides you're using or the pesticides. Um, I often get emails asking me, and I am, I'm a very rubbish gardener and I'm probably not qualified to give gardening advice, but you know, things like use nematode eggs uh, in order to um, reduce um, uh, uh, slugs in your garden. And also remembering that lots of the slugs and snails are not going to eat your uh, plants. Most of them prefer eating uh, rotting vegetation. Uh, they're really good for recycling the nutrients in your soil. I mean, some of them will absolutely decimate your, your hostas and your beans and your lettuces, certainly mine. Um, but, you know, trying to think about ways, selective planting, 
um, destructive planting, things that you can do to not have to resort to uh, chemical uh, poisons that can uh, end up higher up in the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John. And with that, we reach the end of the show, Joe, I'm afraid. Half an hour always goes super <laughs> quickly. Um, uh, so I want to thank everyone as well for sending the questions. I'm aware that we couldn't get through as many, that many, but that might mean that maybe John will have to come back in the future so we can answer those questions yeah. that uh, were left unanswered. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your questions. And thank you so much for the donations as well. Um, uh, but also, especially, thank you so much, John, for coming today joining us and showing the amazing collection you are actually streaming from the museum uh, and telling us about these overlooked animals that maybe now we all watching might care more about so yeah thank you so much john i'm going to say goodbye to you soon but hopefully uh yeah see you see you in the future bye john bye uh, and then again, once again, thank you so much for watching. It was uh, brilliant to have you there and to receive all your comments. It's always great to know that you are there. Um, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for your donations as well. If you want to make one, you just have to pop into our website or do um, do it through YouTube. There's our button near the chat. Um, but if you've enjoyed Nature Life or if you've been enjoying it, just remember the Nature Light happens every Tuesday uh, at 12.30 at the moment. Um, and we have loads of exciting content coming to you next week. My colleague Khalil will be talking to botanist Fred Runcy about um, plants that are becoming extinct in the UK because not all the extinction is happening with animals and not all the extinctions is happening elsewhere in the world. But anyway, if you want to know more about Nature Lifeline, you can uh, check our social media channels and also keep an eye on your website and that way you'll be updated with everything that is happening here. But uh, that is all from me now. I'm going to say goodbye to you now and see you soon. Bye everyone.